Hello and welcome back to the Hansan Cast with me, Emmett Lewis. Unfortunately, uh, we have hit a bit of a roadblock this week where Mikhail unfortunately won't be joining me because, well, as you know, last week he was in residency, super busy and apparently went awesome and they're getting much closer to having a show. He'll be back next week to tell us all about that. But unfortunately, his housemate got corona and he has been... <laughs> Uh, this happened mid of the mid of the production period, so we had to move out like post haste in kind of very short notice. So he didn't have any of his podcasting equipment or any equipment, and he's currently sort of couch surfing at the moment while this blows over. So uh, yeah, you've got an episode, a Q and A episode with uh, me this week. So I will answer some of your questions that we have chosen lovingly for you guys. Uh, next week, Mikael will be back. Or else. Maybe we should make him do some solo shows to catch up and give me a break. I think that's a great idea. Uh, other than that, it's kind of for myself, I suppose, give you guys an update on that. We are currently in lockdown still. I wonder, will lockdown ever end? And uh, yeah, I don't know. It's one of these things. Nothing really much going on other than lockdown constantly. Lockdown for life, really. Lockdown life, handstands. Uh, right, questions. So, Q&A episode where we answer your questions. If you want to ask us some questions, you can submit them to us at Hansan Factory on Instagram, or you can DM them to me or Mikhail or Facebook. All the social media channels available. There's also the contact form on the website as well, which no one seems to use. And if you want to do some voice questions or a dial-in, you can do a dial-in on our anchor.fm slash Hansan Factory so yeah, a few options there. Do the dial-ins, we will play them. We've got a, we have a couple, or I think we at least have one at the moment. But I'm saving that for my Mikael's back because it's uh, nicer, I suppose, to get uh, the full experience when you go to the effort of uh, dialing in for both of us. So our first question. Always have to get my notes open. Bear with me on this one because I can't read my screen from here. Yeah, so, I know there is the exercise of topals when dropping into underbalance, but what I have difficulties explaining to beginners is how to correct underbalance. In overbalance, it's just pushing the fingers into the ground, but with underbalance, I'm not sure how to describe the motion that corrects it. I can't remember myself how I did it in the beginning, and right now it seems too far of the way... It seems too far of the way I do it to explain to beginners. It, this is an interesting question because... Ignore me, kicking my mic. This is an interesting question because it kind of uh, it kind of highlights one of the interesting things with hand balance is as a beginner, your first kind of... The first battle you fight is with overbalance, going over the top. It's very rare that people would even have a sensibility or the sensation of underbalance or what it is or how to control it. The next balance, next battle you fight, and what you fight for most of your handstand career is underbalance. And what we do with most of our handstands, if we think of the whole repertoire of from being able to hold a handstand, everything else is involves controlling underbalance. We have tuck handstands, we have straddle handstands. Everything increases the underbalance demands. Pressing is just a massive display of underbalance and correction. So one, it comes down to just being strong enough. If people aren't strong enough in the upper back, they just don't have a hope of correcting underbalance. The next thing is it's kind of the weird motion that to correct underbalance, they have to have enough sensation of where the balance point is in the hand and be able to push harder through that. This goes for all the kind of corrections that you will do in a handstand whether or in underbalance whether it's bending the elbows, breaking the shoulder line, or just pushing in the shoulder flexion more. It also depends on people being able to understand when to break the shoulders forward into planching and when not. It also becomes anticipatory that you will be anticipating it. Uh, one of the ways to get people to get used to correcting on the balance is one, just get them stronger. Tuck handstand. This is why we introduced the tuck handstand so early in the handstand factory programs and why we make such a big deal out of it and everything. Even if it's wall support, will build the back in the right way that provides the tensegrity for the handstand to be corrected and underbalanced. And the other tip that I found it useful when I was learning handstands, but 
I'm not certain how useful it actually is, but it helped me, is uh, try to lift the fingers off the ground. So you, yeah, so you're down. So if we think we push the fingers into the ground to correct overbalance, try to lift them off the ground to correct underbalance while pushing through the floor. This will help. Generally, it's underbalance comes more from strength. Once people get strong enough, have a sense of balance, and then they're able to do it. Uh, specific actions. You know, it's one of those weird ones. Like, if you press your fingers the right way, you can actually correct underbalance, what you, a correction you would do for an overbalance, which sounds weird, but it's all to do with how you push the force through the sweet spot in the hand. So generally, yeah, get stronger. Try my finger off the ground tip. But underbalance comes as a side product more so than anything else. It's that kind of thing. You can also, like, if someone is strong, you can teach them to bend the elbows and kind of push it out or planche it and start correcting with the shoulders. Obviously, this is not ideal, but if they're strong enough, it's perfectly valid and it's a perfectly good way to correct underbalance. Just, like, planche, bend. Once you kind of reestablish control, lower the center mass somehow, that's what we're doing. Push back up on top. It works. It takes a bit more coordination, but it's uh, it's one way to do it. If someone's a bit weaker, then... They just have to get stronger, really. So, our next question. Uh, good one. Horse stance and side splits feels uncomfortable in the knees, which compounds to pain over a few sessions. Knees are fine otherwise, and legs strong. That's not too special, I guess. They are weird positions, after all. Yeah, they are. Though I would like to get rid of it, of course. Just realize I get the same pain from... Just from... Actively going for maximum separation lying down. So without any so without any relevant load. Any idea why and more importantly how to fix it? Thanks for sharing your wisdom. Uh so basically side splits, it's kinda there's one of these things. It can be you're just not flexible enough, and as you are getting down there, you're just putting like more tension across the joint. So getting more flexible will help. It could be, without seeing where you're actually at, it could be the leverage force is that your hips are still, once again, not flexible enough, and you're using the knees become a downward force, so they end up going into a mind valgus, and this puts the strain across them. Or you could be torquing the knees by keeping the feet down too much. So I'd be keen to play with different split alignments, training maybe toes-up split, training to see if your hips are rolling over correctly it's hard to say exactly without looking at this if that doesn't work then you need to do specific knee strengthening exercises and for specific knee strengthening exercises you want to look up things called terminal knee extensions or peterson step ups or things like that there's a lot of options on this but you just basically want to train the teardrop muscle on the inside of the knee and learn to kind of keep that tense while you're in the side splits and also playing with your angulations. So this will get stronger. It will take a while to get stronger. You know, I don't think it's going to happen in a week or two, but doing this exercise over time will help. There's a lot of ways to do these kind of exercises. So you'll have to check them up and see what equipment you have. You can do them with bands. You can do them with dumbbells. You can do them lying down with ankle weights. A lot of options here. The other thing is, is you just got to like, make sure you're paying attention to the signs the body's giving you in a side split is when you go into it and like, you know, it can be one of those ones where like if you pay attention to the hip and make sure you're localizing the sensation you want in the muscle groups, either the sort of lat the medial hamstrings or the adductors or the adductor magnus, and then seeing am I trying to, by force myself down, am I also trying to force my knees to the ground instead of pushing back into the split? There's one thing what can help possibly in this situation, is you have to think of the descent into the split, is it goes like an upside down question mark. If you were to slide out the split from standing, you slide, if we look at the hips, sorry, look at the pelvis, the hip kind of angle from the side, it goes straight down for a while until the legs kind of meet abduction, then it goes backwards in a curve and reaches a point of maximum backwardness, backward travel, very technical term, and then it'll start going back forwards in line as the legs go wider. So what can happen for some people is you just keep trying to go straight down. You're not allowing this C shape to happen. And the C shape doesn't happen. 
So then by pushing back, you're just kind of pushing the knees because that's the only thing that can really give in this. So you're not working with the kind of body and the sort of hinge mechanics of the hip. So there's definitely this kind of thing to play with and just to make sure you're not actually using your knees as a leverage point. Some other options to play with. Though I have to say, I've tried this extensively and I have not had a lot of success with it. But if it works for you, it will work faster than anything else is the full horse stance to splits progressions where you just constantly squat wider, keeping your knees bent. It's just like doing really wide squats. So you start sumo, horse stance, five step, seven step, nine step, and just use that as your progression. So you're constantly bending the knees and you're not ever locking them out till you get flat. Uh, this is one of those ones like I tried it out extensively. From, got it from the writings of Thomas Kurtz, if anyone looks it up. I tried it extensively for a few years and it works. It's useful and size, horse stance is definitely useful for side splits. The going wider and constantly going wider one, it doesn't work for a lot of people. But if it does work for you, it will be faster than anything else. So it's worth trying for six weeks. Then you'll have a very good idea in six weeks if it's going to work for you or not. Uh, but that will mean the knee isn't in too strained position or too locked into kind of a leg bar. So that's one thing to try out. The other thing to do, what I really like, is to, you know, you can do some of the side split work. A lot of side split work we do is very tense. And you mightn't be able to get, because you're tense, you might be masking some of the sensations you're getting in the splits. And some of the early ones are the, you know, it's like pain will bring something to the forefront or discomfort. And you might be missing something, some subtle alignment thing. What you can do is get a some cushions and either wedge them under your legs or sit on them in your side split and take a lot of the weight out of the legs and then start like mentally investigating every square centimeter of your ankles, knees, hips, muscles, glutes, hip flexors, back, everything involved in the side split and just see if there's some unevenness, if there's something holding tension that could be relaxed, if your alignment is off from the hip, like the rotation of the hip needs to go in a different direction. All these kind of things will go into it and it's kind of getting in there or maybe just doing a bit less in terms of what's going on can be very useful. It's kind of one of those things like if we look at the knee joint, it's a very big and it's a very strong joint, but it has its limitations and its limitations are normally fixed by what's going on in the ankle or in the hip. So by exploring what might be a limitation there or finding out if there's an alignment that you could fix you can probably get around this knee pain issue as well, as well as doing the strengthening exercise and looking them up as well. Uh, I think that kind of covers it. It's other than that, it's kind of become the expert in you, is all I can say, really. So, our next question. Is handstanding aerobic or anaerobic exercise? Uh, it is both. It's kind of one of those ones... Uh, you know, generally we're when we're doing precision work and handstand is very calm, we want to try and keep the heart rate low. We want to try and keep our breathing steady. We don't want to be panting. We don't want to be out of breath. But at the same time, when we start doing stuff like handstand push-ups, conditioning sets, trying to get stronger, then it begins to shift into anaerobic. If we look at our set durations and like our time to failure and our time on the tensions, it kind of would shift that way. Depending, I've never actually really checked heart rates in general in handstand. I think one time I checked them, I got up to about 170 beats a minute in a handstand. But generally, I think my sessions are probably about 120, 110, 100, 120 kind of range. I don't know, this will be standing. Uh, if anyone wants to drop us a line and does some heart rate testing in their handstand training or has one of those aura rings or these kind of things. Uh, in general, it will be because we're trying to be relaxed or low tension. Generally, it will be aerobic exercise. Your heart rate won't be too high and your strenuous won't be too high. If it's a pressing session or handstand push-up session or this kind of stuff or learning new stuff, then you're going to be working a bit harder and it could be straying into the anaerobic zone. But in general, it will generally be 80% aerobic. Ooh, here's a good one. What do hand balancers do to train their legs? Um... That is such a broad question. To answer it, most pro hand balancers who work in circus don't train their legs in the way you're probably thinking. Uh, what most of them would do would either be some tumbling, some trampolining, 
some jumping, that kind of stuff, if even. Now, what should hand balancers do to train the legs is probably a better question. Or what should, like, this is the kind of thing, it's like, you know, it's kind of who we're speaking to here as well, because like there's, I can think of hand balancers, like sort of people who are not professional hand balancers. Once again, like if you're getting into professional hand balancer, you're dealing with a very specific type of person who is pushing. It's like kind of saying like, I don't know, what kind of jogging does a 100 meter sprinter do? Yeah, they probably do some, but it's not exactly applicable. It's not exactly transferable. Or jogging is probably a bad example. What sort of bowling do uh, 100 meter sprinters do? Is probably a better kind of transfer on that. Uh, so, yes, they probably do some, but is it transferring to the sport? Probably not. So, generally, but then again, if we think of those amateurs, I can think of a lot of like quite good amateurs, people who aren't professional hand balancers, or maybe they're coaches, and they've got press, impressive numbers and squats and all this stuff. So, it is something to think about. Generally, I'm going to give you a format I use for my more hand balance focused clients and students that because they're not looking to push leg strength super high, let's say, you know, their main amount of training volume is going into handstands. So generally, I'll only have them train legs once a week. And I think everyone should be training a bit of resistance training. If we look up, you know, if we look up resistance training, injury proofing, tissue quality, doing something slightly different, strength, generally all these kind of things. So, but we need to basically go like, okay, we're putting all our precision stats and all our skill stats into our hand balance training. So it means the weight training has to be basic, has to be very, very basic. So generally what I do as a program for most people, and this is a good template if you want to jot it down, is we will do one bilateral leg variation for one part of the workout. And this will either be a squat or a deadlift variation, generally down to preference, or generally I'll rotate between three of them over three phases. So it might be back squat, deadlift, sumo deadlift, or something like that, or front squat, sumo deadlift, good morning, something like that. Anyway, and then the next exercise in the program will be a single leg variation for the opposite aspect of what they're doing. So if we look at the theory, not too solid in this, but if we look at the theory that we have knee dominant and hip dominant exercises. So if we were doing a squat variation, the single leg variation would be some kind of single leg hip extension exercise. So this might be, we might do back squat for five sets of three or six sets of three or something like that. Then we might do accessories, so maybe three to four sets or six to eight repetitions on, say, a single leg back extension or a single leg good morning or single leg Romanian or single leg something like that. Then our third variation would generally be something using leg curling aspect, either a leg curl, a ankle weighted leg curl, floor slider leg curl, Nordics, this kind of thing. Uh, generally, depending on the exercise, we might play around with rep ranges and what our kind of focus for that phase is. This gives you, and then finish up with some abs and some back extensions, either hanging leg ra- generally hanging leg raises or thing for most hand balance people, and some kind of back extension for higher reps. This gives you a very structured leg program. It's very straightforward. It's easy enough to do. And if you just follow the rules of linear progression and other stuff, you will get very strong. Like I've got a couple of hand balance, like hand balance only people. I've got more than a couple, actually. I've got like five of them off the top of my head at the moment who are all pulling over two by body weight and deadlift and squatting at least one and three quarters body weight with hand balance as their main focus. And then other clients who are obviously training hand balance as well and doing a bit more strength work because they're a bit more involved in strength. So you can get very strong on this type of training. What makes this training work as well is we are doing all our flexibility training as well for our leg training. The flexibility training when we're moving the leg in space is very, very valuable. It is training a lot of the smaller muscles around the hip. It is giving the ability to squeeze those muscles. It may not be training the quads and all of the hamstrings and the calves correctly, but it does a very good job of it. It's kind of one of those things like if we were to look at, I think it's Kabuki strength or some of these other people. A lot of these people have hybridized powerlifting exercises from flexibility ones you see them teaching a hip airplane recently and 
you see that on Squat U as well. And they're like, oh, here's a hip airplane. And then, well, actually, that's a side tilt to what you train for hand balance. Oh, it's this exercise. Well, actually, that's a back attitude. All these kind of things are like modified versions of this. And they're like, saying, that's the greatest thing for your hips ever. And we're like, well, we've been training that for a very long time. So this is the kind of thing. It's a lot of the flexibility exercise where you're moving your legs through space are very good. If you are able to bang out the reps of them or can't get higher, then you add a bit of weight like everything else. Uh, but they do have a lot of crossover. So that was what I would recommend a hand balancer would do once a week. And, you know, it works. It's a good break. Generally, I'd put people generally Wednesday or Thursday in their week if you're wondering where that would go. So it'd be hand balance, hand balance, general strength, day off, hand balance, hand balance, something. So it gives you an idea of how we would do it. Uh, but yeah, so back to the professional hand balancers. Professional hand balancers, like most of the people would come from circus school and most people tumble. Generally, you know, it has gotten better in a lot of circus schools, but generally hand balancers, professional ones, are aiming to keep their legs as small as possible. I can even think of a... So they get strong by tumbling and jumping, which will get you strong as well. It's kind of one of those things that uh, people forget about the basics of a run and jump and surprise yourself. Obviously, we know other stuff as well, but, you know, it does work. And uh, I can think of one hand balancer who will remain nameless, who, uh, very, very good, very good. And he was doing an audition for Cirque, Cirque du Soleil. Uh, the audition for Cirque du Soleil, they do a series of strength tests as well. Always the same test. It's uh, climbing a rope for time or repetitions, uh, press handstand splits, and standing broad jump and some push-ups. So in the standing broad jump, the dude could, on his max jump, clear three meters but his legs were so skinny and so weak, he couldn't actually absorb the shock of them. So he had to kind of like squat, flop, land. But he could actually muster the concentric power to jump three meters. It was kind of an interesting one to hear about. And I was like, ah, oh, it makes sense. So, uh, yeah. So basically, do your jumping. Uh, do some deadlifting to learn to uh, absorb some force and then you're sorted. Hope that kind of gives someone an idea. Then our last question, or possibly not. Ah, last question. In what order can I expect to achieve the different flexibility positions? Pike, pancake, front and side splits, and bridge. Uh, this is one of those how long is a piece of string questions. Generally, generally, as a rule of thumb, most people get a very good pike first. That's basically the only one I can say is a kind of universal that is kind of the entry gate to our pancake. It's the entry gate to our side split. It is the start of front splits, but not quite. Then after that, it can be really hit and miss. Generally, my rule, what I would see is pike comes first, then side split, or then side split or pancake. One of them first. Some people are just, their hips roll over better. They have better hip capsules and sockets for this, and they can just flex the hip joint easier. And some people, their side splits just gets easier. They haven't got a hip socket that's conducive to flexing over super easy. Uh, after that, front split is kind of a weird one. Generally, most people get that last out of the splits. Generally, but not all the time. And then bridge. Uh, bridge is one of those weird ones as well. It's like, you know, I, I can think of a couple of people I've trained and... You know, a few people I met over the year who just like just had a really good bridge with very minimal training, and it then that was it. They could just do it. Maybe the spine was the right shape on the inside, or it was very simple for them, the strong enough shoulders. Whereas splits and all the other stuff came uh, came with a lot of effort. Put it that way. It's generally I kind of have a rough category of people of back benders and front benders. Uh, you pick this up in contortion circles that there is kind of. People who are backbenders and frontbenders and this kind of thing. So it's not always universal, but uh, it's someone you'll find some of it comes easier than others as well. But generally, the order I suggest is the first order will come in. But you know, I can think of uh, I can think of some people I met over the years. I can think of I think of one guy in particular, just for being weird, who had basically a god tier side split. Like his side split was awesome. Didn't need to warm it up. Cold in the morning, boom, minus two in a training hall we were in at the time. Come in, side split. His pike was like, yeah, 
it was just terrible. Like, you know, you could do a standing pike. It was okay. Fingers on the ground. Not that great, especially compared to the side split. Uh, pancake as well was, if you brought the legs into a pancake angle, the pancake going forward was just, like, difficult. It was doable, but it was very difficult for him. Uh, but the side split was just, like, over. But do you hip capsule, bro? Because, no, he didn't. So it's kind of that. So everyone is going to be a bit different on this one. Generally, the order I suggest is good. Uh, but other than that, you do just have to experiment and see what comes for you. And it can just come down to technique as well. Like some people some people can instinctively grasp the technical details and how you actually apply these splits and other stuff in some positions easier than others. We can think of this as like, you know, obviously there's leverages involved in this as well. Like yeah, leverage is a good example here as well. Like the leverage on a side split versus a front split can be greatly can be greatly different if you have big legs versus short legs and if you are long legs and it also on a front split if we are training a front split with our knee off the ground or if we're training it with the knee down there's different leverages going on there so yeah it can be a once again it goes back to that, what i said at the first kind of side split question is like become the expert in yourself and you'll figure out what's going to come from where uh, yeah then just another point i suppose to add on this one is yeah, if side split is coming slow and you haven't really trained pancake, train pancake. Generally, pancake can be a limitation for side split, but not the other way around. So if you haven't been putting a lot of time into pancake and you're really chasing your side split and your middle split, put some more time into your pancake and you should get a crossover effect, but it doesn't always work the other way. Let me check. I think that was our last question for today. Yeah, that's our last question for today. So, uh, thank you all for listening. Mikael will be back with us next week, all going to plan, or else I will have to go to Sweden and brave uh, Swedish quarantine to drag him to the mic myself. Uh, yeah, and I'm looking forward to. Uh, I've been, I've, you know, I get the inside scoop on all this anyway. But uh, we're going to interrogate him about his this process he's been going through, and I think it's going to be sound quite interesting because. I don't know, you guys were listening last week, I was talking about they have the sound and lights in, which is, it's at the stage when a show really begins to start coming together, so that's going to be cool. Uh, other than that, I am Emmett Lewis. Thank you for listening. If you want to check out any of our programs on Handstand Factory, either beginner, advanced, intermediate, presses, all this cool stuff on Handstands, please check out handstandfactory.com. The programs support the podcast. Uh, other than that, you know, you guys have a good week. Send your questions in, like I said at the start. And I'll catch you next time.